We're going to take a few minutes now to remember Jesus around his table. It's a time for Christians to remember Christ and what he did in their place at the cross. And in just a few minutes, we're going to take a small wafer and a bit of juice. And we need to remember that these are just symbols of the body and the blood of Christ that was offered on behalf of all of those who had put their trust in him. It's very important that we remember Christ rightly this morning. We need to be thinking about him rightly. We need to be thinking about him well. Uh, To help us do that, we're going to be looking at a passage this morning that shows us that Jesus proved himself to be the Son of God as he remained on the cross. So if you have a Bible with you, please turn to Mark chapter 5. We're going to be looking at verses 31 and 32 together. If you don't have a Bible, some men are coming down the aisle. Simply raise your hand and we'll get a copy to you. If you don't own a Bible, we encourage you to take this for yourself and begin reading God's word at home for yourself. At this point in the crucifixion story, Jesus is on the cross. And there are several groups of people that are with Jesus at the cross. There's the Roman soldiers who crucified him and they're sitting at the foot of the cross. They really have no idea what it is that they just did. There's a thoroughfare, there's a path, there's a way that passes by the cross area, and travelers are passing by. Many of these travelers witnessed Jesus in his triumphal entry just a few days earlier, and they see the same man who they thought to be king now hanging on a Roman cross, and all they can see is failure, so they are hurling insults at him. Then there are two other men. They're crucified, one on either side of Jesus. Our passage this morning tells us that they too are hurling insults at Jesus. Today, we want to focus on the fourth group of people, the chief priests and the scribes, because they make a claim against Jesus in this passage. And it's when we examine Scripture's response to the claim that these people are making that is going to help us to appreciate Jesus and remember him rightly this morning. So let's read through our passage together. And when we get to the end of verse 31, look at the claim that they make against Jesus. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes, were mocking him amongst themselves and saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. Let this Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross so that we may see and believe. Their claim against Jesus is that he cannot save himself. His death by crucifixion on a Roman cross in their mind, is inevitable, and that is the end of him. So they're saying he cannot save himself. If you look at verse 32, they indicate that if Jesus would come down from that cross, that they would believe in him. We need to get this this morning, that these men have no intention. They have no purpose. They have no desire. They have no inclination in following and in believing in Jesus. We see that because they're mocking Jesus. They're mocking Jesus privately amongst themselves. Their point to Jesus is this. You claim to be the Messiah. You claim to be the Christ. But you're there on a Roman cross. You're hanging on a Roman cross and you are dying. You can't possibly be the Christ because the the Christ, the conqueror, the king is a conqueror. And he is full of strength and he is full of authority and he is victorious. And you are nailed to a Roman cross. But these men are blind. And they are blind to what Jesus was doing while he was on the cross. And what he was doing while he was on the cross is what proves that he is indeed the Son of God, that he is indeed the King, he's the Messiah, and he is coming again. And we're going to look at two passages that help us understand that. Uh, the first passage I want to mention is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. This passage tells us that he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Peter is writing to a group of Christians and he says, Jesus bore our sins in his body on the cross. But what Peter is saying to his readers is not limited to his reading audience. It extends to us as well. It extends to all saints throughout human history who look to Christ as their hope for redemption. Every single sin committed by every single believer throughout human history, those who lived prior to Christ, those who lived contemporary with Christ, those who live after Christ as we do, 
Those that look to Christ as their Savior and their Lord, he bore every single one of their sins in his own body on that cross. You think of the scope of that, the tens of thousands, the hundreds of thousands of sin in your own life, uh, the tens of millions of people across human history who've actually put their faith and their trust in Christ. All of those were compounded together and placed inside the body of Jesus. That helps us begin to have an understanding of who he is and what he did. But not only did he bear the totality of our sin in his body, 1 John chapter 2, verse 2 tells us that Jesus did something very significant in that condition. That he himself is, he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but for those of the whole world. John is saying the same thing that Peter was saying in the last passage. Every single saint that would put their trust in Christ. Not only did Jesus bear their sins in his body, but he suffered the Father's wrath against them. Propitiation speaks to bringing an end to wrath, to satisfying wrath. Jesus actually brought to an end the wrath of the Father against every single one of those sins committed by every single saint throughout all of human history. And that is something that no mere man has the capacity to do. If you look at the surrounding verses in our passage back in Mark 15, you learn that Jesus was crucified at the, nine, at the, th- th- at the third hour at about 9 a.m. He was taken down off the cross at the ninth hour, about 3 p.m. So at most, he was on the cross for six hours. And during that time, he, he actually satisfied the Father's wrath against every single one of our sins. He did that in a matter of just a few hours. We could not even begin to satisfy the Father's wrath against any one of our sins in an eternity. The only reason why Jesus could do that is because he is the King. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. So it wasn't that the chief priests underestimated Jesus. They misunderstood him. They didn't know who he was. They didn't know what he was doing while he was at the cross. So believer, that's the way we want to remember Jesus this morning. We want to remember him as the one who went to the cross, took our sins in his body, and then satisfied the Father's wrath against every single one of those sins and brought it to an end. John 19 tells us that there came a time on that cross where Jesus knew that all things had been accomplished. And one of the things that had been accomplished was the finishing of God's wrath against all of those who would live under Christ in eternity. That brought great joy to Christ, and it should bring great joy to us. So believer, when the elements come to you, take them and hold them and ponder for a minute what Jesus did in those hours on the cross for you, how he suffered and how he purchased a pardon for you, and he set you free from the penalty of your sin, and that is an occasion for great joy. And when your mind and your heart are prepared, take the elements on your own. If you're here this morning and you are not a follower of Christ, please know two things. First, know that we are very thankful that you are here. It is my privilege to bring the truth of God's word before all of us this morning. But it's also our privilege as a church to host you. It's our privilege to worship together with you. But if you are a follower of Christ, know that in addition to us being not a follower of Christ, know that in addition to us being very thankful that you're here, you need to understand that that Christ's work on the cross um, is for those who believe in him, those who actually follow him and obey him. Those who breathe their last breath, never having trusted Christ, never actually having followed him and committed their life to him, they will attempt to spend an eternity suffering God's wrath against them for their sin. But today is an opportunity for you to turn away from that and to turn away from that eventuality. Place your trust in Christ and trust that when he was on the cross 2,000 years ago, he satisfied God's wrath against everybody who would come after him who would believe. This is an opportunity for you. After the service, there will be some people up here to your left, to my right. Uh, They would love to talk to you about what it means to have a relationship with Christ. But when the elements come to you, just pass them to the person next to you and use this occasion to think about Christ and the work that he did in all place of all of those who would trust in him. So men, come and serve us, and then I'll be back in a few minutes to close our time in prayer.